a woman this afternoon. You all know her, but before even I introduce her name, let me just call her a Canaanite woman. In Bible, you see Canaanite woman or women both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. So I might just bring some parallel, parallels or connections between those two. But I am going to be mostly speaking from the Old Testament, uh, from the life of this lady who's got a bad past, got a questionable background, a Canaanite woman. And uh, that's who I'm going to be speaking this afternoon. And this woman, although she seems so, un, you know, seems so questionable and not so reputable and somebody you don't really want to talk about and somebody's got a shameful past, bad background, you don't want to talk about her so much. But yet, in the New Testament, you find her name a few times. Bible is not ashamed to talk about some of the names that you may be ashamed of. Bible talks about those names not just in the context of their bad past, but in the context of how God transformed their lives and turned their life around. Amen? When you read the book of Hebrews, you're going to find this lady in chapter 11. And there it says, because of the way she took care of the two spies. You probably now already know the name of the woman that I'm talking about. Because of the way she took care of the two spies, God favored her. God delivered her. God saw that. She hid two spies. Now the book of James chapter 2 towards the end talks about two people as faith heroes. Now, we know J uh, Hebrews 11 talks about faith heroes, but this is talking about James, and James talks about faith heroes and only mentions two people, and one is Abraham, our father, the father of faith, and two, it is talking about this woman. You all by no, now know. I'm talking about Rahab, Rahab. And here in James chapter 2, it says, because of her faith and because of her work, in other words, it's not just that she believed, but when she believed, she did something. She acted upon it. So here, Hebrews and James are talking about two aspects of what she did. One, Hebrews says she took care of the spies. She was hospitable or she, or, or she hid the two spies. Now, that is a beautiful thing. She was hospitable. She did something. She hid the spies. Uh, James talks about her works, that she did something and God justified her because of her works. Now, let's go to Joshua to see more about this woman. But as you're going to the book of Joshua chapter 2, let's also just stop by at Matthew chapter 1. Uh, when you just stop by at Matthew chapter 1, you find her name again. You think it's only in Hebrews and, and in James, but it's also in the very first page of the New Testament. Wow. Her name is mentioned in the very first page of New Testament. That means she's got to be somebody important. Her name is now mentioned and pulled into the genealogy of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Wow. In other words, she was like a great, 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 great grandmother of Jesus, our Savior, the Redeemer of the world. In Matthew chapter 1, you know, the, you find about five women, five women. And out of the five, Mary, of course, is the new one, and she's of Jewish background. And, and Bathsheba, David's, or Solomon's, uh, mother, David's wife, she is also, who was formerly uh, Uriah's wife. Now, Bathsheba, she's also a Jewish woman. But then just before Bathsheba and Mary, you're going to find about three other names who are actually not Jewish people. They're not Jews. 
One is Tamar again, another woman of bad reputation, Judah. Got, you know, Paris and Sarah through Tamar. So Tamar won, got a bad past. Now there's another one. Her name is Rahab. We talked about her already. And Rahab again has got a bad background. And Bible calls her profession as it is. There are commentators and theologians and people of Jewish background trying to sugarcoat it by calling her innkeeper. But Bible doesn't call her innkeeper. Bible calls her prostitute. She's got a bad background. Rahab. You know, when Bible calls about talks about Rahab, there are three things it talks about. It, it, it talks about where she comes from. She was a Canaanite woman. So her background, her family, Canaanite. Her trade, prostitution. Her character, a liar. Coming from Canaanite background, does something that is so bad, and now her character, she was a liar because she told the king's army men that these two spies are not here when she was hiding them on the rooftop. You with me? Now, that's the second woman, Rahab. The third one is Ruth, again a Moabite woman. And all these three women, they're not from Jewish background, they are from other background. But God finds a way in his sovereignty to bring them into the very center of his plan. I want you to know something, no matter where you come from, what you've, do, what you've done in the past, what kind of mistakes you made, God has a way of bringing you in to the thick of his plan, to the center stage of his action. Whatever God wants to do, he will do it not because of your holiness and piousness and righteousness and your greatness and your fasting and prayer. God does things in your life according to his sovereign plan and according to your faith. Do you want to be part of what God wants to do? If you want, if you want to be part of what God is doing and if you want to be part of the greater things that God has in store for you and what God is doing in the history, I tell you something, what you need to do is to believe and take a step forward. What is so interesting in the genealogy, and this is what I want to mention quickly. There are so many things that we can talk about it, but the thing that I want to mention quickly is the fact that when you actually study this genealogy and go back into the history in the Old Testament and count them and look through it, you find something. You find that Matthew, when he's writing this genealogy, this family background, family tree, he misses out a lot of names. And I, I, I asked, like, what? Matthew found time and took the effort to put in the name of Rahab and Tamar and Ruth when there are other people who's got a not so bad past. And he could have easily put them in. Are you, are you getting what I'm saying? Why would Matthew put their name in, these people's name in, when he should have actually, you know, put some other people's name in, and it would not have looked so bad. It would not have looked bad. It would have covered up things, you know. Nobody would have, you know, tried to go and, you know, look up at the history and say, you know, is Rahab in the history? No. It would not have happened. But Matthew wants people to know that Rahab, Ruth, and Tamar is part of your history. When, when he pushes out some name and ignores some names, he put these names in. See, if you know some of our relatives, we actually want to keep some of those names away. Some of those, in, in some of those people, <laughs> some of those people that we are not, some of the relatives, you know, I would rather, you know, ignore their names and not mention their names. If you know their behavior and if you know how they act in front of people, you just try to bypass them. So I understand why Matthew did that. However, but why would Matthew put these people's name in? And I understood something when God is about to do or when God is doing something historic in the world. Birthing. Jesus, his son, 
what he's trying to show you and show us is that it is not your holiness and your greatness and your prayer life and your fasting that you did in the past. It's how you acted when faith moments and when historic moments came by you. I tell you something, some of the greatest miracles that happen in my life is not because of my great prayer. It's not in the context of 21 days of fasting and prayer. It happened when I did something, when I acted upon something, when those moments arrived. Oh, hallelujah. I want you to know something today. When moments arrive, do something in faith. That's why, you know, when pastor preaches, when we preach here, we talk about waving your scarf. And today, Jolene did that, lifting up your, you know, wallet and praying over it. Why? Because when this God moment arrives, when the Kairos moment arrives, when the unannounced time of God, when it arrives, you don't want to be standing still. You don't want to be standing in the background. You don't want to be standing in the sidelines. You want to act upon it. You want to do something. And when you do something, you make that moment yours. Amen. And I tell you something, Tamar did something, Ruth did something, and here is Rahab who acted upon the moment. I tell you something, when heaven opens up, do something. When the atmosphere opens up, do something in faith. You know, Prophet, I can share a lot of story, but I want to bring in uh, Prophet Tijo's story. I tell you something, you know, about, I think a couple years ago, there were so much, you know, issues and so much attack against the prophetic ministry and all of those things that in, in, in India and especially in Kerala. And at that time, Pastor Anderson went there and he spoke a message about crossing over, crossing over. That's the message he spoke. And you know what Prophet Tijo said? Prophet Tijo said, you know what, you know, I didn't pray for 21 days, nothing. But after the message, I learned the message, or I heard the message, and I said, you know what? God, if that message is true, then I'm crossing over. Do you know what he did? He was in the, in the rooftop thinking about the message, meditating on the message, meditating on the word of God. And you know what he did? There was actually his wife's scarf that was hung on the roof. And you know what he did? He took that big scarf or shawl, whatever you call it. He took that, and he held it in front of him, and then he just walked, and he threw it on the back, and he said, I am crossing over. And I tell you something, what happened is that after that, he says, Western doors or doors to the states and doors to other parts of the world opened up for him. Why? Because when a moment arrived, he acted upon it. Amen. I wish at least some of you would clap your hands. Because when the moment arrives, you don't want to be quiet. When the moment arrives, you don't want to be sitting there with your mouth shut. When the moment arrives, you want to capitalize and take full advantage of the moment that comes by you. Hallelujah. Can I get some people this afternoon who will capitalize this moment that is coming our way? I tell you something. We are on the precipice of something big. We are on the verge of great breakthrough. We are about to see the walls of Jericho crashing down. Some of you are about to cross over into your promised land. But what you got to do is this. Sometimes the things that seem so crazy, you may have to do it. Come on, can I have some people who will do what the Israelites did? They screamed, they shouted, and the walls came down. Hallelujah. Bad idea, bad strategy. Man, like, uh, when did you last have a wall come down because you screamed? Never. But that time when they screamed and when they shouted, the walls came down. Why? Because when a God moment comes, you want to take full advantage of that moment. Come on, can I give you one more opportunity this afternoon? Can I have some people take this opportunity? When the saints gather together, the presence of God is in their midst. When the people of God come together, unite together, the the presence of the God, presence of the Lord is in their midst. And today, can we declare something? Yeah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, can I have some people? Do something or say something. Do something in faith. Act upon the moment. Do something. It's not because of your prayer. I don't care what your past was. I don't care what you said this morning. But this moment, can you do something? Can you cross over? I want to say today, walls are coming down. I want to declare today, every intimidating walls, they are coming down. I want to say today, giants are coming down. I want to declare today, everything that stood in the way of your progress, it's coming down. Hey, hey. Hallelujah. 
would you declare with me today, walls are coming down. I say that not because we all know about Jericho walls. I say that because I see in the spirit that some walls are coming down. I see the Lord breaking some walls as you are praising, as you are lifting up your voice. Some of the walls, some of the walls, some of the walls that stood in the way of inheriting your promise stood in the way of conquering your promise stood in the way of getting hold of what god has promised over you stood in the way of receiving your promise come on i am here to declare some of the promises is about to be released hey glory 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 when you act upon the moment you may sit down when you act Upon the moment, you're going to find yourself part of the history. When Tamar, when Ruth, and when Rahab acted upon their moment, despite of where they come from, despite of their trade, despite of their character flaws, all of it, here they find themselves right in the middle of God's plan. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Some of you need to get ready for your name to be mentioned in history. Some of you need to get ready for your name to be part of what the Lord is going to do in Edmonton. Some of you need to get ready to have your name written in terms of what the Lord is going to do in Canada. Oh. The bigger your faith, the bigger your rage. Come on, I am not just going to get ready for Canada alone. I'm going to get ready for the ends of the earth. Come on, do I have some people who will act upon a moment? I'm going to get ready. I am going to have my name written in the pages of history because of what the Lord is about to unfold. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 It's not by might. It's not by power. But it's by the Spirit of God. When you act upon a moment, the Spirit of God will overshadow you. When you act upon a moment, the Holy Ghost will come upon you. And He will equip you. He will empower you. He will push you in the promise of God. Somebody needs to get ready for, the, for what the Lord is about to do next. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Some of you need to get ready. You know, the reason why I stand here and pause here for a few minutes or a few seconds is because I strongly feel in my spirit that some of you are on the precipice. Some of you are on the verge. And some of your names are going to be written on buildings. Some of your names will be written on a plaque. Some of your names will be written in terms of what the Lord is doing. Some of your names will be attached together with the revival. Some of your names will be attached together with Bible schools. Some of your names, you never thought that would happen. You never thought your name will be connected to a business. But I want you to know today, you never thought it. But God has a different plan. It's now part of my message. I didn't plan to say it, but I'm going to release the word. The Lord is prompting inside of me. And I want some of you to know your name is going to be connected and attached together with what the Lord is about to do. Hallelujah. Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah. Now, you find a name in... Matthew chapter 1, and now we go to Joshua chapter 2. When you go to Joshua chapter 2, you know, some, one, one thing that as an, as, a, as an introduction, let me say this. A lot of things that you find in the book of Joshua, you find also in Exodus. In the history of the journey, especially the beginning of the Israelites' journey. When the Israelites came out of Egypt, at the beginning of the journey, they crossed the Red Sea. And here, before the Israelites inheriting the promise, Jordan is dried up. Red Sea, Jordan. There's a contrast. In other words, their beginning of the journey and the end of the journey is bookended by similar kind of miracles. 
At the beginning of the journey, they had water come out of rock. And towards the end of the journey, they again had water come out of the rock. From the beginning of the journey, they had manna falling. And at the end of the journey, not manna now. Manna ceased and they are eating the fruit of the land, the crop of the land. So you see a contrast to the beginning of the journey and, and at the end of the journey. So in other words, the beginning of the journey and the end of the journey is bookended by similar kind of miracles. What happened at the beginning of the journey is now repeating or coming back again towards the end of the journey. Now some of you may have had some horrible start. Some of you, just like the Egypt or Israelites when they came out of Egypt, they had to face Pharaoh coming after them. It was just hard. They came through, but it was hard. It was big battle. They had to face Red Sea, and I tell you something, we talk about how God opened up the Red Sea, but you don't think about the danger in which they had to walk through when God opened up the Red Sea. I heard a man of God say this, you know what, when we talk about Red Sea and when we talk about God's deliverance, we rejoice because God can open up Red Sea. But can you for one moment imagine and visualize what they had to go through when water is standing on both sides and they never know when it's going to come back down? And it's easy, you know, oh, they went through the Red Sea, thank God and all that. But I tell you, when you're walking in the middle of a wall of water, you just never know. It's not holding by concrete. It's water. It's water. When is it going to come down? And then when you look inside, you're going to see some sharks, some whale <laughs> on both sides. Just don't know if they're going to like, <laughs> if they're going to come out and snatch somebody. It was dangerous when they're walking through it. A lot of people talk about the deliverance, but they don't talk about the preamble and the danger that was involved, what they had to walk through. Are you with me today? So, you know, they had to go through some horrible, torrid times. They had to go through some difficult times. And here again, when some of these things are happening again, what can happen in the back of their mind is this. God, after 38 years and at the end of the 40th year, are you taking us back to the same place? Is it going to be a repeat again all over? Or oh, whatever happened at the beginning of this journey. Sometimes, or many of us, we have a beginning or a specific period in our life where that phase or that period began not on a good note but on a bad note. Sometimes that phase when you were about to enter, you thought it's going to be awesome and it's going to be great. But when you were expecting great and awesome, what happened is the very opposite of great and awesome. <laughs> you, were, you were thinking that, you know, the next phase, wow, I came this far, wow, awesome. You know, you're expecting all going gung-ho and beautiful. And all of a sudden what happened is the exact opposite. And now that place and that moment offers you bad memory. And you were trying to get away because time, in some sense, is a healer. It's not a healer, but in some sense, help you forget or, or at least distance yourself. And now it happened, and after it happened, you are thinking, well, that was at least 30 years ago. Praise God. It was at least 40 years ago. Praise God. But what happened is that the same thing that they were trying to forget or ignore or push away, push to the background, now those kind of stuff again coming back. Now, what are they going to think? God? What is this? Is the same cycle going to repeat in my life? Is it going to be a repetition all over again? Do I have to start again? Do I have to go through the same crisis and the turmoil again? And when I ask that question, some of you, I tell you something, you saw a certain number at the beginning of some of the things that you went through. You saw a certain number or certain things. It flashed. You saw some certain dreams. And it came back. And, or, or it happened. And you thought it was good. Or maybe sometimes you got scared. And what happened is, you know, after, that, after seeing that number or after entering that phase, it was all going bad. It was all going down the hill. And now 
All you think is, I don't want to see that number. I don't want to see that person. I don't want to go through the same thing. I don't want to remember the same thing. I don't want to, you know, uh, remember that dream. You know, but what happens is this. That was the beginning of that phase. But towards the end of the phase, here, all of that comes again. And now there can be a fear. There can be this anxiety. Man, am I going to go through this all over again? And I asked the Lord. Is it all over again? And the Lord said to me, no, it is not all over again. Whatever the devil snatched away from you and caused in your life as a fear, as thing that you should be running away from or afraid to deal with, Whatever you dealt with that at that moment, whatever the enemy snatched away from you at the beginning of the journey, it is time now at the end of the journey to restore back to you in full. Whatever the devil took at the beginning of the journey as his, I am now returning it back to you as yours. Hallelujah. Whatever the devil took in the beginning of it as a sign and a symbol of devilish demonic activities, God is bringing back again and showing you this is not about a repetition of the past. This marks the end of the season. This marks the end of the season. This marks the end of the season. Oh, hallelujah. I'm prophesying over people today. Some of you are seeing the same thing repeat again. You had to go through water at the beginning of the journey. And now again, you have to walk through the water. And you are thinking, man, is it another 40 years? I want you to know today, it's not going to be another 10 years. It's not going to be another 40 years. It's not going to be another 7 years. This is the end of the old season. This is the beginning of entering the promises of God. Oh, hallelujah. God is about to negate and delete some of the bad memories. He's bringing back some of those things for you to know. It's not the devil who is in control. It's me. I am in charge of your life. Whatever the devil took as his sign and his symbol and his number, God is about to return back to you as his number, as his sign, as his symbol. Oh, I'm prophesying over people today. It's not a repetition. It's restoration. Not only restoration, restoration in full. I want somebody to say it with me. It's restoration in full. It's the end of the cycle. It is the end of the season. God is bookending this journey by saying, that phase is over. That face is over. Somebody shout back at me. That face is over. That, ba- that face is over. Devil, if you think you're going to be afraid. No, 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 no. That face is over. This is the beginning of a new season. That season is over. That season is over. That season is over. That season is over. This is a book ending. A new chapter is opening in your life and in my life. Oh. I tell you something, Peter had to go through this. Peter had to go through this when you read the last chapter of John's gospel. Peter said to Jesus in a bragging, in a boasting way, he said, no matter whoever disowned you, I will never disown you. I will always love you. I love you, love you, love you, Lord. (laughs) All these people, they're not as Christian as I am. Me, I will never leave you. Peter also said, when he died, when he was crucified, when he was buried, man, I thought he's going to be with me. Now he's gone. What do I do? Let's go for fishing. The man who said, I'll be with you. I love you always. Now the same man, out of his mouth, he says, let's go fishing. So he said he loves me. I loves him. And he now says, let's go for fishing. Because he's, he's thinking, when Jesus was there, he was able to multiply bread. But now that he's left, who's going to multiply? Who's going to feed me? Who's going to feed my family? I'm going to go for fishing. Now, same, Jesus, same Peter who said, I love Jesus. Now, in front of a little girl, the servant girl, in the high priest courtyard, before the fire, before the fire, <laughs> before the fire, he says three times, I don't know him. No, no, no. 
you sound like Jesus. No, I don't know him. I don't know what he's talking about. He cursed and he lied and he walked away. Three times he said, I don't know him. I, don't, I, I have nothing to do with him. In front of the fire, the ambient fire. Now John's gospel, the last chapter, when you come to it, they go fishing, they're coming back. Look who is standing in the shore. It's Jesus. He's not just standing there. He's got something in front of him. He's got fire. <laughs> now he's got fire, but it's not just fire. On top of the fire, he's got something. He's got fish. And then he asked Peter, do you, come on people, do you what? Do you love, how many times? Three times. Now, he said, I love him. And he walked away. What did he go for? Fishing. Because he wanted to take care of his belly. Where did he disown Jesus three times? In front of the fire. And now Jesus brings back the same ambience. He brings the fire. He brings the fish. And he asks the question. Do you love me more than this? What is this? He doesn't say, do you love me more than this? He says, do you love me more than this? These. You know what I mean? Do you love me more? Fire? Net? Boat? Fish? Do you love me more than all of this? These? His failure, these things that he saw was the marking of his failure. Now Jesus bring back the same series of events in front of him and says, do you love me? Hallelujah. And at the end of it, Peter had to say, I love you, I love you. And he said, you know it all. I'm not going to answer nothing. You know it. You know it. Why? Because you know it was in front of fire, I denied you. You know I denied him three times. You know it was for fishing, I went. And now you are bringing all of it and asking me the same question. You are bringing the same series of events again and asking me these questions. And I want to say today to some of you, you are facing similar series of things. But I want you to know it is not for condemnation. It is for commissioning. It is for commissioning. It is to commission you. It is to commission you. Let me, let me do what Pastor Anderson would do. Put the microphone on. Hallelujah. 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 Can I have some people today say the series of the same events and the same symbols? It is not to condemn me, but to give me a new commission. A new phase is beginning in my life. Oh, 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 hallelujah. I am standing here and I am, you know, I'm going to take a second here. Because I know this is a word for somebody. Some of you are seeing the same series of events. Some of you are seeing the same symbols. Some of you are seeing the same numbers. Yes, the number 11, when it first, when you begin to saw it, we see it first, it was bad. But now God says, it is time for you to reclaim it. It is time for you to take it back. Number 11, yes, at the beginning of the season, it was bad. But now I'm bringing that number back again to show you, I am the boss. I'm going to turn it around. I'm turning the page in your life. Come on, can I have some paper today? Who know what I'm talking about? In the beginning of the phase, it was a headache. In the beginning of the phase, it was this. In the beginning of the phase, it was a backache. In the beginning of the phase, it was my son going this way. But I want you to know today, some of the same series of events are occurring right in front of you. But it is this time not for loss. It is not for bad. It is not for repetition. It is for a restoration. Ho, oh, oh, ho, oh. ho. Come on, somebody put your hands together. Somebody bless the Lord. Somebody lift up your voice and give God a praise. The repetition of the same events is not for you to keep on going in the same cycle. The repetition of the same events is happening for you to know that season is over and a new season has begun in your life. This is a book ending. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Sit down, sit down. 
And now, in chapter 2 of Joshua, verse 4 and 5, from two, 3 onwards, you're going to see again, then the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, bring out the men who have come to you, who entered your house. For they have come to search out all the land. Verse 4. But the woman had taken the two men and, what? Say it with me. Healing them. <clears throat> and she said, true, the men came to me. But I did not know <laughs> she's lying. She's lying. She's lying. True, the men came to me. But I did not know where they were from. Verse 5. And when the gate was about to be closed and dark, the men went out. I do not know where the men went. Lying. She is there in the rooftop. Pursue them quickly. She is lying. For you will overtake them. She is li she's lying. She's like, again and again. No, 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 no problem. She's lying. But she had brought them up to the roof and hid them with the stalks of flax and that she had laid in order on the roof. Now, I want you to understand something here. The reason why she did that, when you read chapter 2, you will see that Rahab gives an account of the history. Rahab is a prostitute who lived, when you read it again, and we will read it again, some of the other verses. When you, when you, when you read it in chapter 2, you see that Rahab lived in the wall of Jericho. Now, how do you, how do you live in the wall of Jericho? Now, historians say... That the wall of Jericho was so wide that two or three chariots could ride on top of it at the same time. That wide. It is not the small, silly wall that we see here. It's not the flimsy walls. It is a wall that is so wide where three chariots could ride on top. And inside the walls, there is human shields, human shield to protect the people. And people living inside the wall. There's houses in it. And in one of those houses, she stays. She's neither in Jericho nor outside of Jericho. She's a Canaanite by citizenship, a Jerichoite by citizenship, but she's living in the wall. And the thing about people who are neither in nor out or people who are living in the wall is they know what's happening in the inside and they know what's happening on the outside. They have this knowledge of what is going on. They're like the CNN of the modern time. <laughs> People living in the wall is like CNN because they knew all the news that's happening. Except it wasn't fake news that she knew. She <laughs> it wasn't fake news. She knew the real news. And the real news she heard and she gives an account and she says to the spies, now she's telling them, she says, well, we have heard, and the people of Jericho have heard, the Lord is with you. And they've also heard what the Lord has done for you. What do you do? Your Lord, your God, has now dried up Red Sea. Wow. We've been serving gods, and these gods have been demanding stuff from us, but never done such a thing for us. These gods, pagan gods that we are serving, we did so much for them and always demanding so much from us. But your God, it seems like they are doing or your God is doing something for you. We've been doing all this, nothing. But here is your God doing all this for you. Wow. I want, before I go on further, I want you to know, we serve a God who is a miracle working God. We serve a God who is alive and well. We serve a God who is not like the pagan deities. We serve a God who can dry your bread sea. We serve a God who is not like all the other gods. We serve a God who is able. Can I have some people who will celebrate this God? My God. My God. My God is not like other gods. My God is not dumb. My God is not mute. My God is not deaf. My God is alive. He hears. He sees. He speaks. He acts. Come on, do you serve a living God? If you serve a living God, give Him a living praise. 
Give him a living praise. Give him a living praise. Give him a living praise. Give him a living praise. Hallelujah. Our God is alive. Hey, hey, hey. Your God can dry up Red Sea. Not only dry up Red Sea, but your God, we have heard that your God has defeated the kings of Amorites, the Og and Sihon, God, Sihon uh, kings. Your God has defeated them. We know that it's a big deal because naturally speaking, with the eyes of logic and human wisdom, these kings are big and these kings are mighty and these kings are strong. These kings are very powerful. They got the weaponry. They got the army. They got everything going for them. They got it. But with all of that on their side, you somehow have defeated those kings. That means it's not you who fought against them. It means there's a power that is working behind you. There's a power that is working through you. There's a power that is working for you. I want some of you to know today. And I want Edmonton to know today. I want the Western world to know today. I want Eastern religion to know today. I have a God who works. Can I, can I do what Margaret did? Woohoo! Hallelujah. We have a God who is able. We have a God. Come on, do I have some people who believe that our God is able? He can still heal the sick. I said he can still heal the sick. Our God is able. No matter how powerful your enemy is, no matter how weak you may look like, I want some of you to know today that your God is able. It is not by might, it is not by power, but it is by the spirit of the living God. I want some of you to know today the powers in Edmonton, the powers in the Western world, the religious powers of the Eastern world that is encroaching and creeping into the West. I want the devil to know my God is big. My God is able. My God is strong. My God is mighty. My God is alive. Yay! Hallelujah. My God is able. We have heard. And because of what we have heard, because of your testimony, I came to believe your God. Because here she says, your God, she says, your God is the God, is the God in the heavens and on the earth. And the reports about what your God has done for you has melted the heart of the people in Jericho. Hallelujah. Two things that happen. Your testimony, your report can boost up your faith. Two, your testimony of what the Lord has done will melt the heart of the devil and the powers that want to attack you. Amen. It will boost up your faith and it will create fear in the enemy's camp. I want some of you to take hold of the testimony. Take hold of the report. I don't know what you're hearing. Don't hear CNN. Don't hear Fox. Don't hear what the world is saying. Don't hear CBC. Hear what the Lord is doing. Hear the testimony of God's goodness. Hear the report of God's wonderful, miraculous acts. If you can hear what the Lord is doing, your faith will pump up. Your faith will go up. Come on, can I have some people? Don't hear gossip. Don't hear what they are saying. Don't hear what bitter people are saying. Don't sit in the company of the mockers and the sinners. Come on, I want to ask you, what are you hearing? Because what you hear will boost a fear or boost a faith. I don't want fear, I want faith. I don't want fear, I want faith. Fear melts your heart, but faith will strengthen your heart. I don't want fear that melts my heart. I want faith that will strengthen and embolden my heart because I got some promises ahead of me. She heard. Come on, do I have some people who have heard some good testimony of what the Lord has done? She heard, she heard, she heard. She heard, she heard, she heard. She heard. And the king of Israel or Jericho also heard. But what he heard was that these people have come to take hold of the place. 
And what happened is this. I want you to know something. Even the devil and the demonic world know your presence. The demonic world knows your presence. You don't have to announce. You don't have to say nothing. I don't still know how the king of Jericho came to know about it. But when you are an anointed man of God, when you're an anointed woman of God, when you operate under the Holy Spirit, I want some of you to know the devil knows you're present. The demons recognize your presence. I want some of you to not get scared and run away, but I want some of you to say, if the demons recognize my, pray, uh, my place, if demons recognize my presence, I want the devil to know I am here not to back off. I am here not to lie down. I am not here to have my heart melted. I am here to possess my promise. I am here to evacuate the demonic activities in my life, in your life, in the land. Come on, can I have some people who want to evacuate and expel the demonic activities of the devil? The devil heard and Rahab heard but what she heard turned into faith. Your God is a real deal. And then she says something. She says, when you have your wall coming down and when you defeat the city and when you burn the city, would you also consider me? Would you <laughs> make sure you save me? But when the king came, this is what happened. They made, an, they made an oath. But when the king came, this is what happened. She hid, she lied and she hid the servants of God, two servants. I, you know, I really want to, you know, go deeper into it. I don't have time, so I'm going to be quick. I just, let me just quickly go. So she hid. So she heard. And the second thing she did is she hid. You know, there's a beautiful contrast that's happening in the book of Joshua. Chapter 2, Rahab, the Jericho hide, hid something. But chapter 7, you find after the walls of Jericho was crumbling down or was collapsed, there is a man named Achan. He also hid something. Achan hid the property, the possession, the gold and the silver of the land of Jericho. But here is a Jericho hide, and Achan was an Israelite. An Israelite is hiding what is from Jericho. But here is a Jericho hide, a Canaanite woman, Rahab, hiding what is of Israel. Everybody is hiding something. <laughs> Everybody's what? Now look at your neighbor and ask this question. What are you hiding? It's not that are you hiding something. It's not are you hiding something. They are hiding something. It's not that are you hiding something. They are hiding something. But ask what are you hiding? Because what you hide can either save you or destroy you. Rahab was saved by what she hid. Achan was destroyed by what he hid. Now I want some of you to know today, we are people who hide. You know what we hide? We hide the possession, the promise of God. We hide what belongs to us in the future. The promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey, I want it. So I'm going to hide a deposit of my future. Can I have some people? I'm hiding something. You are hiding. Don't hide anything malicious. <laughs> Don't hide anything malicious. Hide the promises of God. Hide your future because you are about to walk in it. You are about to cross over. You are about to go in it. Come on, can I have some people today? Give God a praise. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> but this is what I want you to know. The spies came down from the wall through a rope. Verse 15 says through a rope, chapter 2. Rope. You know, there are historians of the origin saying many things. But verse 18 says, this rope. What rope? 15 says, through a rope they came down. Verse 18 says, this rope. But, 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 but in verse 18, here is the author giving more details. It is not any rope now. It was a rope she let down or let out the spies. But now, there's a description about the rope. 
Now, it's not just any rope now. This rope has some details. This rope is now the scarlet cord. Rope has now changed. And God says it is not just a rope. Now, her rope of faithfulness and hospitality to let down the men of God has now turned. God turned it, to, turned it into a scarlet cord. Hallelujah. The cord she used or the rope she used to let out the spies or the people of Israel now has become the same cord or God turned it into a cord through which salvation is coming into her house. She heard, she heard, and it's a house. I want to go into the details of it because it's in a house while everybody comes. And then it happened. You know what happened? Oh, I love this. <laughs> Hallelujah. It was a rope, but now the rope has become a scarlet cord. And it happened. She made an oath. The oath was this. When you come and burn, please don't destroy us. My family, my friends, or my relatives, my daddy, my mommy, my brother, my sister. I mean, name, you name it. Everybody she can name it, she named it. And the spy said, bring them all to your house. If they are in your house, they are saved. Can I just say something? Be in the house. Be in the house. When you're in the house, you are protected. <laughs> when you're in the house, you are covered. Oh, hallelujah. Your mood doesn't have a role. The weather doesn't have a role. Oh, hallelujah. How you feel doesn't have a place. Be in the house. Can I say that one more time? Be in the house. Be in the house. Everybody be in the house. And if you're in the house, you will be saved. Make sure you keep the scarlet cord on the window. Bind it. Bind it. Keep it. And you know what they said? If you do that, keep the scarlet cord and have the people in here, nobody will perish. Nobody will get burned or die. Everybody will be saved. But my question is this. These two spies, how are they going to save these people? I wish Rahab asked. Now, by the way, you made the oath. How are we going to do this? Because it's good to give promises when you can keep it. But how do you know they can keep it? Because they are not the one who is going to bring down the wall. They are not going to be the one who is going to destroy the wall. It's going to be God. If it is God, how can they speak on behalf of God? But this is what they said. Oh, you want to be saved? Everybody in the house will be saved. You know, one thing, one thing. Just do this one thing. Keep the scarlet cord on the window. Make it visible. Make sure this is visible. How can a scarlet cord, you know, save them? You know, they understood something. They said that because of a testimony. Because of what they know. You know what they know? When they were coming out of Egypt, when Israel was coming out of Egypt and when the angel of death was going throughout the land of Egypt, what we did was we put the blood, the red blood on our doorposts. And we are saved. We understood something about our God. If you can have the red blood, if you can have the red color on your house, you will be saved. I want some of you to know today, the blood of Jesus Christ still saves. It still saves. I don't know where you are, but I want some of you to know today, I got the blood. I got the blood on me. Come on, somebody declare, I got the red blood on my life. I got the blood of Jesus on my life. It doesn't matter what happens around me. I am saved. I tell you why I can say that. Because you know what? When the praise, the wall collapsed. Uh, when the wall collapsed, I tell you something. Rahab and everybody is in the house. And Joshua says, go into the house and get her out. That means her house is the wall. And all the walls are coming down. But there's one part of the wall. One part of the wall. All the walls are coming down. But one part of the wall says, no, we won't come down. Because we got the blood. 
One part of the wall says, no, 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 no. We won't come down because we made a promise. I want you to know when you have a promise over your life, when you have a blood covering of, over your life, I tell you, no matter what goes down around you, you will not go down. I got the blood of Jesus. Come on, somebody lift up your voice. Hey, 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 I'm done, I'm done, I'm done. Everybody, would you stand up? Everybody, I'm done. Everybody, would you stand up and say, I got the blood. I got the blood covering. I got the blood of Jesus. I got the blood. I got the blood. I got the blood. I got the blood of Jesus. Come on. Somebody shout, I got the blood. Hey, do you want to know how long the scarlet cord was? Do you want to know how long the scarlet cord was? God brought her in, but when God brought her in, God brought her through a saving and cleansing process, but did not keep her in on the periphery, did not keep her, you know, in the boundary. God brought her all the way in, all the way in, all the way into history, all the way into the genealogy of Christ, all the way in, all the way in, all the way in. You want to know the length of the cord? I'll tell you the length of the cord. The Bible says in the book of Ruth, the last paragraph, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 1, now, Rahab married Salmon or Salmon. Rahab married Salmon. And through Salmon, Rahab and Salmon had a son. His name is Boaz. You know who Boaz is? If you don't know who Boaz is, let me give you the other name. And Boaz, through Ruth, had another son. His name is Obed. If you don't know who Obed is, just hang in there. Obed had a son. His name is Jesse. The chances are some of you still don't know. Jesse had another son. Now you men know the name, and the name is familiar to you. Jesse gave, a son, gave birth to a son, or begat a son, and his son's name is? Jesse. Do you want to know the length of this cord? It goes all the way in. This cord goes all the way in. But it doesn't even stop there. Matthew 1 says, now in that lineology, genealogy or lineage, Jesus, the Savior, was born. It doesn't matter what past you have. It doesn't matter where you come from. When you act upon a moment, God can turn your situation around. When you act upon a God moment, and when you get hold of it by faith, God can change your life. Do I have some... Rahab's, not by trade, not by character, but people who can say, I don't come from a very good ba background. I don't come from a family with all the godly history. I come from humble esteem, low esteem. I come from a place where I don't have much, but, but my God switched. My God flipped the script. My God changed my story. Do I have some people today? Who can say, my God, flip my spread, my God, change.